that's a little bit what it's like for a new pastor sometimes coming into a congregation, isn't it? Where there's been good pastorates, and it can be a challenge. And I want to talk to you about that today. And so I would encourage you to open your Bibles to chapter, uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 18, in regards to Elijah and Elisha, entitled Transferring the Baton. And if you're uh, able to stand as I read from God's word, please stand. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Be still. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I'll not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be still. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance, and the two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle, folded it together, and he struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they'd crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken from you. And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them in two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and he struck the waters and he said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the waters, they were divided here and there. And Elisha crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him saw, him saw uh, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. They said to him, Behold, now there are with your servants fifty strong men. Please let us go and search for your master. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him on some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, Send. They sent therefore fifty men. They searched three days but did not find him. They returned to him while he was staying at Jericho. And he said to them, Did I not say to you, Do not go? Heavenly Father, would you speak uh, to this congregation and pastor and uh, further prepare them for the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Elijah was a prophet of God, a mere man, but he was called as a prophet. And what are some of the things that we remember about Elijah? Well, first of all, maybe that he prayed that it would not rain for three and a half years. It did not. He prayed that it would, and the Lord sent rain. That unique way that he was fed by the brook of Cherith, by ravens. Or the widow of Zarephath, the bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the Lord, word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. And then probably the most famous one of all, with the prophets of Baal and the duel that they had, and Elijah praying and calling down fire from heaven, and God answered and licked up the sacrifice. And don't you think that that would be a tough act to follow if you were Elisha? In our text, we learn that a time of testing occurs in the work of God when it's time for leadership to be transferred. And there's a transfer of leadership that's taking place here today. What is important, Pastor Carr, is that you have the same God as prior pastors have had who have served this congregation. And so... I'm praying that God will do what he wants to do through you in this congregation. First of all, look at the testing of loyalty 
in verses 1 through 6. In 1 Kings 19, 19, we read that Elisha was in training under Elijah to learn to be a faithful prophet of God. In verse 1, loyalty is tested when one's leader is about to leave. Pastor Jones had served a church for more than 30 years, and he was loved by all. He was especially known for his gardening. Unfortunately, his replacement, Pastor Smith, didn't know a spade from a hole. One day, a church member approached Pastor Smith with the comment, You know, our former pastor made it a point to mow not only his own lawn, but the church lawn also. I am aware that Pastor Jones used to do that, replied Pastor Smith. And I discussed it with him, and he said now that he's no longer the pastor, he doesn't want to do it anymore. (laughs) That's kind of the attitude you need to have, Pastor Carr, if you get compared to the prior pastor and what what he used to do. Two different people, different gifts, and congregation. It's not your place to compare one to the other. Businesses get transferred to the next generation, and pastors get called to new responsibilities, and some people leave a church when the pastor leaves. Would Elisha here be loyal to God? Elijah was going to Bethel, and here we're not told why. It appears to be a test. And it says in verse 2 that Elisha would not leave Elijah. As the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. And think about how loyalty seems to be in such short supply today. Elisha's place was to learn all of the days that Elijah was with him. Moreover, loyalty is tested when others tell you your leaders will be taken from you. You know, it's hard enough to be losing your leader and then others come and tell you, do you know that he's going to be leaving? It's kind of like a a loved one on a deathbed. You want to hang on to them, and you want to hold them. Verse 3 tells us that the company of the prophets told Elisha his master was leaving. Now you've got more voices that are coming to remind him of what's coming. It's almost like you want to just kind of plug your ears and say, I don't want to hear it anymore. I want to keep things the way they are. Elisha, in verse 3, didn't want to hear about it. Yes, I know, he says, be still. And think about how Jesus, before he left, he told the disciples that he wasn't going to be with them much longer. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But they didn't want to hear it, or it was kept from them, and they weren't able to grasp that. And I want to encourage you as a congregation, be faithful to your Lord, and to the pastor shepherd that God has supplied for you, as long as he preaches from the word of God and believes this is his inerrant word, be loyal to that to whom God has supplied for you. Now this same scenario is repeated in verses 4 through 6 about him going on to Jericho, and I'm not going to repeat that. It seems to be another test if Elisha would keep following. Moving on to verses 7 through 12, look at the testing of separation. Time was moving, the sun was moving westward, the earth was rotating, and hairs were turning gray. Verse 7, look at the separation was observed by the prophets. It says there's 50 sons of the prophets. I think about these as seminary students that are standing on the other bank, other side of the Jordan, and they're watching to see what's going to happen between these two prophets. They had followed Elijah, but who now? Is there going to be any real prophet of God for us to learn from? What are we going to do? And I want to encourage you, Pastor Carr and your wife Brenda too, that don't be surprised if it takes people a little while to gain trust or confidence or faith in your leadership. Children, or adults. That's natural when leadership is transferred. And usually it takes a few tests that come your way to see, is Pastor Carr going to give in to one person's opinion in the congregation, or will he follow what God says in his word, even though it might be costly? What will it be? People will be observing you to see what you do. Are you for real? Is God that important in his word? 
Verse 8, the separation was preceded by a work of God. Look what it says in verse 8. Elijah took his mantle, folded it together, struck the waters, and they were divided here and there so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When I read that, I wonder, did that encourage Elisha? Or did he look at that and say, oh, here we go again, another miracle. How am I going to? What was the result of that in that situation? He witnessed, though, the power of God firsthand. And Pastor Carr, it is so important that we remember that we serve that almighty God, who is the God of miracles. Verse 9, the separation was an opportunity for Elisha to request a double portion of Elijah's spirit. The power was in God's spirit working in the prophet. And you know, God has promised that in his word to us. Isaiah 55, 11. The word of the Lord will not return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. And over in Jeremiah 23, verses 28 and 29, is not my word like a hammer that shatters the rock in pieces? That's the power of the word of God today. And Pastor Carr, these are challenging days to be a pastor, to preach the law of God, the law of God, which is the truth of God that brings conviction of sin to sinful human beings so that they see they have a need for a savior. And then to drop in the gospel that Jesus paid the price for your sin. He fulfilled that law in your place and you can be forgiven. You can be set free from sin and you don't have to carry that weight of guilt around in life anymore. Film producer Sherry Lansing was the chair of Paramount Pictures and Lansing had a Interesting explanation for her success. She said, I had a good role model. It was my mother. She escaped from Nazi Germany when she was 17. She came to this country. She sold dresses, learned to speak perfect English. When my dad died of a heart attack, I saw my mother cry and mourn and then take over his real estate business. I remember one of her ma office managers saying, you can't do this. You don't know anything about real estate. And my mother said, no, I'll do it. Teach me. I can do it. And I've never forgot that. Teach me, I'll do it. There are times, Pastor Carr, when you come to your church council, to your deacons and say, how do I speak a story and, and relate to these people? <laughs> I'm from a different area. There's things that we can learn from the congregation. Working together. Shepherd and congregation, just like Elisha, is learning to be a prophet of God. Verse 10, then the separation occurred as God took Elijah in a whirlwind. It says in verses 10 through 11 that Elisha had asked a hard thing. Your pastor is here to shepherd and to train you according to Ephesians 4, 11 to 12. The question I want to ask you as a congregation today, are you willing to be trained and taught by your new God-supplied pastor? Adult Sunday school times, home Bible study times, Wednesday nights. You know, D.L. Moody made the statement that it's better to train 10 than to do the work of 10, Pastor Carr, but it's tougher. But that's what you need to be. The shepherd is called to train and disciple to help the congregation use their gifts to the glory of God. Because it's not all up to the pastor. I hope you didn't call him to do it all. You have gifts given by the Spirit of God. He's to be your equipper to help you to work together well. Look at Elisha's response in verse 12. Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen... And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them in two pieces. Elisha's response, God's spirit was now on Elisha. And you know, I've got good news for you as a congregation. It isn't just your pastor that has the Holy Spirit today because we live post-crucifixion, resurrection, Pentecost, and every one of you who have repented of your sin and are trusting in Jesus. Have the Spirit of God living and dwelling in you. 
and together you serve the living God, not just the pastor that has God's spirit, the testing of separation. And then thirdly, in verses 13 to 18, look at the testing of new leadership. Do you know new leadership and responsibility can be frightening? Nine years ago, when I was elected to this position to serve as president, you know what my first responsibility was? A pastoral suicide. You talk about something that I thought like I would never have to deal with. I remember when I went to the office that morning and found out about it, I called my wife. I said, pack your bags. We have to head north. We have to be at that church tonight because there are two congregations that are together that are grieving. And they are scratching their heads wondering what in the world has happened. How do we make sense of this? It happened to be my wife's home congregation. A pastor that I knew very, very well was struggling with depression. I went into that meeting that night and another pastor was leading it and people were talking. The family was sitting in the front pew and after they were all done talking and sharing experiences and praying, they called upon me. And I went forward and asking, Lord, guide me in what to say. And I'm so thankful for Deuteronomy 29, 29. I don't know if any of you know that verse, but that's a great verse to have in your back pocket at certain times. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever and ever that we may do all the words of this law. Has God revealed everything to us? No, he hasn't revealed it all to me. Pastor Carr, he hasn't revealed everything to you. You're called to be a shepherd and to share what you have here. And 2 Peter 1.3, Dr. Munseth taught us that verse and the application of that very well. In this Bible, we have all things for life and for godliness. And I asked that congregation, do you understand what happened here today? I said, I don't understand it either. But does what happened here today change anything in what God has said in his word? No. I asked the confirmation class, would your pastor have ever counseled you to do what he did today? No. Can you understand how difficult that is to understand? We will never understand that in this life. But it doesn't change what God has promised here. This will never change. This is truth. The only place of truth. And Pastor Carr, you've got that. We don't know what's coming in this world. We don't know what we're going to face as a congregation. But you have what you need right here to stick to it. I love verse 13, how Elisha attempted what his leader had done. He took up the mantle. He didn't sit back in timidity, but he took up that mantle and he went and he struck the water. Look at verse 14. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elisha crossed over on dry ground. Isn't that a beautiful thing? He saw the waters divide. Pastor Carr, don't sit back in timidity. <laughs> Go forward with what God has called you to do. There was a bald man that took a seat in a beauty shop. Let that sink in a little while, okay? How can I help you, asked the stylist. I went for a hair transplant, the guy explained, but I couldn't stand the pain. If you can make my hair look like yours without causing me any discomfort, I'll pay you $5,000. No problem, said the stylist, and she quickly shaved her head. Don't call me at 3 in the morning when you get that, okay? <laughs> but you know, that's an example of what we need to do as pastors today. Sometimes we scratch our head. How do we do ministry today? It seems like things have changed as a congregation. How do you reach out? How do you reach people today? But don't sit back in timidity. Go forward with what God has said to do. It's like a new believer. Don't wait to hell. You have the whole 
book of Matthew memorized to share your faith. Just tell people what Jesus did for you. And God will use it. Memorize those verses. Tell people truths from God's word. And God will use it. Elisha crossed over on dry ground. I love telling the story about one of our missionaries. And he had gone to the field and he knew the language. And one day he got a knock at his door. And here was this older lady who was a missionary. And she introduced herself and she said, well, I'm here. And he said, well, what about it? Well, she said, I sent a letter about a month ago telling you I was coming. Well, unfortunately, she beat the letter. He never got the letter. She explained to him that she had had a near-death experience. And after that, she had said, Lord, if you raise me up to good health, every day of my life, I will tell at least one person of what Jesus has done for them to save them from their sins. He said, well, do you know the language? No. You're going to translate for me. She's a very bold missionary woman. <laughs> Pastor Carr, how would you like that to come? She said, I'm going to be here for 30 days. I'm going to follow you around all of those days. And so that's what they did. So the next morning, she said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to the bank. She said, I'm going with you. They went into the bank. He took care of his business. He came back. She said, that's the person I'm going to talk to. The guy in the three-piece suit happened to be the president of the bank. So they went up to him. He goes up to him. She starts talking in English. And she says, tell him that I have many children all over the world, but I'm an unmarried woman. And he looks back at her like that. And she goes, translate. So he starts translating. And he says to the missionary, wow, you've got a really modern, cool grandma. And she says, tell them that these are spiritual children all over the world. I'm a Christian. I have shared Jesus with people. They've repented of their sin and they've come to know Jesus as Savior. And they're spiritual children of mine. And you're a sinful man. And you need a Savior too. And as he translated, the tears started running down the bank president's face. And she simply gave him another elbow and said, finish him up and walked away. Can you imagine that? Wow. Elijah crossed dry ground. The waters divided. Verse 15, the prophets saw that Elisha was the new leader. The spirit of Elijah rested on Elisha. Here in verse 15, they bowed before Elisha. And I don't recommend you bow before Pastor Carr. But it's a sign of humility, isn't it? saying we recognize you as the shepherd that God has supplied for Pastor Carr's congregation or God's congregation? God's congregation. He purchased it with his own blood. Acts 20 tells us that, right? He purchased it with his own blood. He has sent Pastor Carr here to shepherd and to guide you in these days. And, of course, in verses 16 to 18, there will always be a few in the congregation that say, well, maybe we can still find the old pastor somewhere. <laughs> they went looking for Elijah, spent a few days doing it, and he told them not to go, and finally he said, go ahead and go, but they never found him. Well, I've got news for you. Your old pastor is gone, and he's being used somewhere else. And let the Lord use him in that new place. Pastor Carr, you've been called by God to deliver his word to this congregation. You've been called by this congregation to visit the sick and minister to this congregation. And Brenda, you as the pastor's wife have not been called to serve the congregation, but to be a wife to your husband, to be his helpmate, and to be a mother to your children, and to use your spiritual gifts as a part of this congregation. In congregation, I want to remind you that you can do destructive things to your new pastor by comparing him to old pastors. It would be very similar to 
men, your wife saying to you that, you know, I saw a magazine the other day and boy, so-and-so's biceps and triceps and sternocleidomastoids are a lot bigger than yours. And what does that make you feel like? Or wives, what does it feel like when your husband looks at pornography and compares you to another woman? And what does that do to a relationship? It absolutely kills it. Comparison. There is never to be comparison in the family of God. Your pastors before have had strengths and they've had weaknesses. Your new pastor has strengths and he has weaknesses. And so the strengths cover the weaknesses in the body of Christ and you work together as a team to the glory of God. And so the question you don't want to be asking today is, where is Pastor Grothy? Where is Pastor Horn? <laughs> where is Pastor Johnson? You want to be asking, where is the Lord God of Pastor Horn? Where is the Lord God of Pastor Johnson? Where is the Lord God of Pastor Grothy? And where is the Lord God of Pastor Carr? Those are the questions you want to ask. Because this is his place, right? This is his church. And it's him who will do the work in his church. Father, I pray you'd strengthen this congregation, this pastor and wife. And thank you for the new leadership that you have supplied for your church. May it be to your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, sing.